This investigative look into the migration of the Israelites was inspired by a simple search I did with my family's last name. In Portugal, about the 17th and 18th century, many persons bearing the surname of Rodriguez and Mirage were condemned to death at the stake or to lifelong imprisonment on the grounds that they were Jews and refused to convert to Christianity. I knew nothing about this growing up. I'm a Roman Catholic. My parents are Roman Catholics. My grandparents are Roman Catholic. None of our relatives talked about this connection to the Jews of Portugal. It's pretty exciting to me, and it was also shocking. Welcome to the Mirage Network. I am Unapologetic Rob. I have a guest here that is going to shed some light on this very topic. I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Hines. Thank you, Rob, for this opportunity to be a part of the program. Before I begin, I'd like to give thanks to my elder Shadrach, who is the founder and master teacher of the Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries of Toronto, Canada. This is where I got my, my education, my enlightenment. This is where I was able to tell the difference between education and speculation. And this is what I would like to share with you today, an opportunity to present a new way of thinking that would enhance the educational process of all individuals. Well, my very first question is the million-dollar question for me, is what are the Jews doing in Portugal? You know what? That's a $10 million question for me, too. The, the essence to this question has to do with the fact that you use the term Jews. And I always say that if you show me a person who say that they are a Jew or a Reubenite, a Benjamite or a Levite, mm -hmm. in today's world, I will show you a person that is not telling the truth. Because no one knows from which tribe they came. If the person has said Israel or Israelite, then that puts an entirely different perspective on the matter. The reason being, we have been enslaved. And when I say we, I'm talking about the Israelite nation. We have been enslaved for 400 years. That's a long time. Not one drop of record. No records were kept. So who then can say with any degree of certainty which tribe they're from? This is why we are more general in the statement, and we say Israel or Israelites. Now, to answer your question, Portugal was, used to be a kingdom of Iberia, and so was Spain, what is now called Spain. They, they, they probably had another name for it at the time. But this was one of the countries, if you will, or as a matter of fact, under the name of Iberia, when it used to be one, that our Israelite forefathers settled about the year 711. So I can imagine they came from Timbuktu to Cordova and elsewhere in Spain, and this they were there for several, several years, from 711 to about 1500. So I can imagine then that, yes, they would be Israelites in Spain and in Portugal and elsewhere in the Mediterranean region. Now, you said about slavery, um, the people you're talking about, the Israelites, are they different from the, the people in Jerusalem today? <laughs> the answer to that question would be yes. Mm -hmm. And to give you the proper details, I would have to go to the scriptures to show the evidence. And in this, this uh, setting, we are not going to go to the scriptures. We are going to stay within the framework of history and culture. However, mm -hmm. having said that, the entire comprehensive view of this subject matter is spiritual. And this has to be understood, but we are not using the scriptures to, to bring the point okay. across, because then people get a little bit confused. Now, just to clear it up a little bit for myself, <clears throat> are you saying that the children of slavery are descendants of the Israelites? That is correct, oh, okay. yes. And we could prove that at least a dozen different ways. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to start? 
Well, I mean, if you want to start with Portugal, and I, and I think you, you mentioned some very interesting uh, subject matter there, the, the point that your ancestors were yes. having such a difficult time, just like my ancestors, because we are connecting as the same family. We may not look alike, mm -hmm. but I, this is part of what we are trying to establish, a new way of thinking. Uh, a thinking that allows for depth of character and not just superficial commentary. In other words, what I'm suggesting here is you cannot tell the nationality of a person by just looking at them. You have to go deeper than that. I see. You have to understand the, the purpose of that individual. And, and in this entire framework, I'll tell you what I see. I see a king who has an objective of punishing his children for their disobedience to him, even his firstborn. And he then has set a time span for their enslavement, 400 years, even in the new Egypt that is now called the United States of America. The point is, at the time when that was done, and even at the time of, of Portugal, that United, Nation, United States did not exist. Mm -hmm. So how did these things happen? It's like a chessboard. You see pieces being put in different places to form a comprehensive unit to accomplish a specific task. Most of the activity behind the scene is spiritual, highly spiritual. But what most people understand is totally physical. So they're missing out on 67% of the background of this subject matter. Now, now my father's last name is Rodriguez, and my mother's last name is Moraj. And like I read in the opening, they were persecuted for being Jews. Now, were they converted to, to being Jews, these people, my ancestors? You know, I cannot give a definitive or uh, correct answer to that question. But I could tell you this. The Israelites, as I said before, they settled in Iberia under an Islamic banner in the year 711 from Africa. They came all the way from Timbuktu to Iberia, and they even went further even to Provence in France. Mm -hmm. And they were there from the seventh century, uh, actually from the eighth century, to the 15th century. That's a long time. And that's a, the length of that time could involve changes in, in appearance. But that's not the issue here. Yes, I could say that the Israelites of Jerusalem in the day of Moses and Paul were rich in the melanin, mm -hmm. but there is much more to an Israelite than appearance. Uh, if the heart is not right, if the heart and, and to have the heart right, the heart must be circumcised, and that individual must serve a specific God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, who created heaven and earth. If that covenant is not in place, then it doesn't matter what you look like or what you call yourself, then it nullifies everything. Now, what started this migration? That's the, the, the heart of the question, the, of the matter that we are dealing with here. It is, as I said before, a judgment call. The judge is the king, the king of Israel. He is creator of heaven and earth. And because his firstborn, which would be the Israelites, disobeyed, he has sentenced them to 400 years of slavery as punishment. And as I said, this 400 years would have to be served in a country that will be defined as the new Egypt. And that country, as we know it today, this is going back to the days of Moses, but this country is the United States of America. And again, as I said, you know, we are limited here because we're looking at a historical perspective, but it's still within the spiritual framework. And they did not come straight from Jerusalem to Virginia. There is a lot that transpired through the Roman Empire, through, as we said before, Iberia, through North Africa, through even West Africa before all of that. So this, this is where we would have to go to flush out the historical perspective in a spiritual framework. 
Did this happen a, a little after 70 AD, the, that migration? That's correct. That's, that's when a lot of it began. And by 135 that year, the 99% of all the Israelites had already left the promised land. They were throughout you know, Asia, Africa, and then later on into the Roman Empire, um, around the Mediterranean to the south especially. So they spent about almost a thousand years traveling in Europe. They spent a lot of time, and it is, it is an amazing um, appreciation of the wisdom of the king of Israel because in the process, they helped to lay the foundation for a powerful Europe. And I say that because when we look at the economy, we see a lot of our doings as Israelites. We see the same thing in Western Africa. We see the same thing in Western Asia. And wherever we go, we put our hands in that country and lifted it up. But we did not benefit mm -hmm. from their prosperity. And that, that in itself should give you or give us an, an inkling of where we're headed. Because how is it that we lift up those that were in the garbage pail, and, but then they get to rule over us without our uh, ancestors receiving any benefit from their rulership? So while the Israelites are in, are in Europe for almost a thousand years, they're also in Africa as well? That is correct. They, they, they were in Africa, then they were transported from Africa to the... Um, to the Americas, to Virginia. That's the Atlantic but slave trade you're talking about. The Atlantic slave trade, okay. that's correct. But the key here, because let's look at it this way. The Europeans did not have the, the education to know about um, traveling the oceans. They, they mm -hmm. couldn't even run their own household. There were no, no colleges, no universities, nothing. These are people that were stuck in the garbage pail. So with our forefathers coming into Europe, they were lifted up because we injected a sense of appreciation, not only for what the surroundings, but also to look, because the key here is the covenant. This is the one motivational component that helped our Israelite forefathers. Because we had the covenant with the, the God of Israel, we were in a position, and, and according to the covenant, we had to teach our children. We were in a position then to be strong and confident on education. And we're not just talking about memorizing stuff. We're looking at a comprehensive perspective to know what is written, why it's written, and how to take advantage of it from different perspectives. We're looking at a holistic educational process, right? And whereas the Europeans, even today, theirs is, is lateral. It, it goes out, but there's not, it doesn't ever you know, end at anything, whereas ours continue to, to encircle mm -hmm. the earth, around and around the earth. All I'm suggesting is that we got our knowledge from our Father, and we returned to him the praises and the glorification in the process. That is the cyclical manner or the comprehensive manner I'm talking about. There is no lateral where it falls off the edge or, or something of that nature, or you can't tell the rest of what you're talking about, like what does it mean? So this is why I'm suggesting that there's a lot that the Europeans have learned from the Israelites mm -hmm. at no profit to the Israelites. Now, when, when Israel mm -hmm. left their homeland, were they slaves throughout all these different nations that they uh, went into, and even in Africa? Or were they like the common man? Were they royalty? What was their life like? The Israelites had a great life in Africa, and places like Ghana and uh, you know, Timbuktu, Mali, all those places. They, they did some tremendous um, learning. They set mm -hmm. up an, Were these places built by them? Yes, a okay. lot of these places were built by them. Like I said, they had advanced knowledge. Mm. And, um, and, you know, later on, we, we can get into some of the details. They, they understood the agricultural process very well. And given the fact of 
the climatic conditions in any prevailing um, geographical location, they were able to take advantage because they understood certain things that most people may not even understand today or right. take for granted, whatever. So uh, they did well at Timbuktu. However, one of the things that they had to come to grips with was that a part of the cast of this universal uh, change were, was the Ishmaelites, who were known today as Mohammedans or okay. Muslims. Mm -hmm. And they controlled a lot of the, the economic um, routes mm -hmm. back then. So in order to get into those routes to sell your, your, your produce, you had to be in one accord with them to a certain degree. In other words, you had to make agreements, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes we take these agreements too far, you know, and before you know it, you know, we are intermarrying, and as we intermarry, we begin to serve their gods, which was another error, and so on and so forth. However, some of them, they pretend to do it, and then in the latter of the day, they will come back to their own culture. But nevertheless, you can only do that for so long before generations start to think, well, hey, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. So they profited well. They had gold. They had um, books were one of, the most, um, one of the most expensive commodities. And they, you know, they fished and you know, all the different products that they did in Western Africa. However, because they were associated with the Ishmaelites, that created a lot of confusion, created a lot of competition, and one thing led to another, and before you know it, they're being sold by the Ishmaelites to the Christians. Mm -hmm. You mean confusion meaning identity? Not necessarily identity, but remember that we're in a spiritual environment, meaning the global or, or uh, the, the universal aspect is highly spiritual. And remember that we talked about an objective. The objective was punishment. Mm -hmm. Punishment of 400 years in, of slavery. So the judge has already made um, the decision of the punishment. He also made a decision as to where these Israelites were going to serve their punishment, how long it was going to be, and so on and so forth. So they couldn't or they wouldn't naturally just go there and say, okay, enslave me. Somebody had to do that. Right. That's where the casting comes in. The Ishmaelites were selected as the sellers. The uh, Christianity was selected as the buyers. But neither the Ishmaelites nor Christianity were strong enough to do that. Mm -hmm. So they had to be given a leg up. And it just so happens that the Israelites were with them and they supported them in that endeavor. Maybe in good faith, thinking they'll get it in return. They never got it. You mentioned earlier concerning your, your ancestors yes. and how they suffered at the hands of Christianity because they were Israelites. That period in European history is called the Inquisition. Right. I like to call it the Christian Inquisition. Mm -hmm. They look like Christians, but as you said, they were not Christians. You see? But saying that is one thing. Proving it is something completely different. So they, they didn't practice openly. Is that what you're trying to say? That's right. They after and Initially, they did. Because under the Islamic banner, after they arrived in Iberia, they were allowed to practice their own culture. Mm -hmm. Israelite, you had the Israelites doing their thing, you had the, Mo the Muslims doing their thing, and the few Christians that were there were also doing their thing. And that's one of the things that was well established at the beginning, because the Israelites, as you know, they dominated the entire perspective, and they were confident in what they did mm -hmm. and serving their God. So they don't have to you know, hurt anyone if they didn't agree with them. Okay, fine. That's why I like to say, stay in your own lane. If you stay in your lane, everything is fine. Is when you cross that barrier without the proper indication, then you create um, the possibility of an accident and you can hurt yourself. 
So initially, everyone had an opportunity. And the entire Iberian Peninsula was just so uh, um, productive. Everyone came from all over Europe to learn mm -hmm. from these people and to study and, and to, to gain you know, economic advantages, etc. When the Israelites started to get really high on the social ladder, then others, primarily the Christians, started to say, well, what have we done here? You know, this is not what we wanted. You know, we wanted them, maybe they can stay, because obviously the Israelites were smarter, and that can be uh, proven all over. If you look at the architectural design of, of Iberia mm -hmm. and other places, you will see it. And this was just the beginning. We can go on and on from this point into of a wide range, you know, medicine, science, uh, music, uh, everything. They were there. They did it. The record is there. To, to We can see that even today. But once you recognize that, and this is the, the Christianity, that and the, the, the mistake that Christianity made is they wanted to use the same book that the Israelites mm -hmm. were using. Then they could not compete because they don't understand it, right? And the Israelites did. So you don't want to give way to the Israelites, and then you play second fiddle. If it's your land, you want to be the top dog, and that's what Christianity had to do. So they all look alike after generations or close enough, Right, maybe a little dark tinge here and there. One way to prove then who is who, because you can deny that you're serving the God by yes. name on the whatever. They call the males over. Okay, drop your pants. Hmm. Wow. And when they see a circumcision, then they know I see. who you are. And that's just one of many different tricks that they played and things like that. Therefore, at that point, they would even burn you at the stake or take away your property and kick you out of the country. They did whatever they wanted to do because it was law at that time. And one of the, the things that they used to do, they would say that, you know, and this goes to the, the appearance issue, that all the Christians, they called them, how do I say this? The so-called white man was a Christian. And the so-called black man was not. He was heathen. Mm -hmm. I think the, the Pope will call them uh, Saracens or Moors or whatever. you know. And um, all of these things were exposed then. But what it did is give Christianity an upper hand over everybody else. Now, you said something. You think over time uh, the Israelites lost some of their culture? Especially when you said that... Uh, they had to show if they were circumcised or not. I could see how some people would stop circumcision just to save their life and their family's life. So after a few generations, they would probably forget to, you know, the law of circumcision or it just becomes normal not to get circumcised. It, it, it became very difficult for them to practice their culture. And, and that was just one example, but a lot of other examples that, that can be given over time. So the, the whole idea was to bring that pressure, you know, intense and more intense to the point where, like you said, they would eventually quit, you know. And if they don't want to convert, then you had to go. And you find that there were many times when they were kicked out from different countries. Yeah, they were in Spain before Portugal at this point, right? That Well... They, they came into Spain, and I don't, I don't separate the two countries. I, I, okay. I put it as one. They're two kingdoms. One is Portugal, one is España, whatever they want to call it. And they, they were there. Then when Portugal became their own kingdom, then things were different. But they still, they were in Spain, and they got kicked out. Some went to Portugal, some went to Northern Africa, some went to um, France, Southern France. And, and elsewhere in Europe. Some went into Rome, for example. Wherever they could find an opportunity to serve the nation of, of the people of that, they were welcome. But once they begin to get too strong, too powerful, then they they're, had to... They're killed. Ah, I see. So it seems like there's some kind of cycle there every time. It's like usury. They used their lights for whatever re reason. Mm -hmm. They got too powerful, they kicked them out. Right. 
And that, that was the cycle that they went through. You know, in 1066, for example, they helped William to go from France to Britain. He invaded Britain, and uh, he became the king there. And the, our Israelite ancestors facilitated that transfer of power. And they did that because they had the financial means to accommodate him. And he said, okay, you'll pay, and I will let you come. And they went into Britain. They established in England uh, a lot of interesting things, not only um, the legal perspective, the educational perspective, and so on and so forth. But then, in the, I think it was in the 12th century, they were kicked out. Again, because they, they were becoming too powerful, too strong, and too independent, mm -hmm. because you don't need the rest if you know what you're doing. You said that the Israelites left uh, architecture behind. Yes. Uh, did they also leave schools or yes. libraries? Yes. They, again, you're entering in Spain, for example, Cordoba and, and other places. You're entering a region where there were no books. Zero. Mm -hmm. Right? And no one could read and write. All of that educational um, opportunities were relegated to the priesthood, the Catholics, you know, mm -hmm. And, um, and they're, they're close buddies. But the average person, they had no reason to be writing anything. You're talking about the Europe's, yeah, yeah, Europeans. the Europeans. And it's really, really fascinating how all of this occurred because we had a situation in Northern Africa, for example, if you want to go there, okay, where the Israelites were living in Carthage. This, and Carthage was a Phoenician city. This was at a time when the Roman Empire was at its strongest. And they did so well there, they almost they continued from the apostles going back to the days of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And they used to appoint the bishops to the various European cities that wanted to study according to Israelite scriptures. They appointed a bishop to Rome for example, right? At that time, we had a situation where idolatry was very, very powerful in Europe. But there were also Europeans who were interested in learning about the truth. So we facilitated that aspect of it. And we would submit to them or to, or to approve and send to them a bishop who would teach them accordingly from our scriptures. This continued for several hundred years until the idolatry first it was it was um, the political structure was set up by Constantine mm -hmm. the emperor of the Roman Empire about 325 and that emboldened the the um, the Romans to progress and to to get a lot of power but they couldn't stop the appointment of the bishops from Carth from Carthage in North Africa by our Israelite ancestors. The way that they were able to achieve that is something that is very, very prominent today through deception and through, uh, what do we call it, where we stab each other in the back. Mm -hmm. And they, they found that one of the bishops that they appointed, I think is, he was Bishop Stephen, he did not do as he was instructed to do but he betrayed his own. And because of that betrayal, then the Romans or the priesthood there, or the Catholics, they appealed to the emperor at the time, and he started to investigate them. And everything changed with that dynamic. That goes back to the days of, of Elder Cyprian and Elder Donatus and, and people like that. And a lot of them were... There was a time even when you could not even have the Israelite scriptures in Rome. They had to burn. There were so many books burnt back then. you know. But the, the idea was to use violence to usurp the authority of the Israelites and gain that power that they exercised over time. And once you have the power, then you can do anything you want. Now, Christianity gave birth in the time of Paul. Not saying that Paul started Christianity, but in that time, it kind of 
started to grow. And as the Israelites migrated, did that, that migration give Christianity that, that, that room to grow and build and become a powerhouse? Well, I have, I have to disagree with that statement because there was no Christianity until about the 16th century. What happened at the time of Paul was that we sent him out as a minister to teach, mm -hmm. to introduce to the Gentiles and the opportunity to learn about our God who created the heavens and the earth. It is, it is one thing to know that you exist regardless of who you are, but it is another thing to know why and to know who created all of what you are taking for granted and enjoying and benefiting from. So Paul went to teach them, to share with them the wisdom of our Israelite forefathers, and he did a very good job. However, he was constantly battling idolatry all over Europe. And it didn't begin there. Mm -hmm. It started out in Babylon. And then it went from Babylon to Egypt. And it was magnified in Egypt. And a lot of the, the Europeans benefited from Israelite, sorry, from Egyptian knowledge, Egyptian wisdom, under the name of the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. The, the Greeks got it by way of the Phoenicians, and then they passed it on to the Romans, and then the Romans were also in Egypt, and they got some of it. So before you knew it, all this idolatry is prevalent throughout all of Europe. And that is what gave them the, the confidence and to challenge what our forefathers were trying to teach. Because... You know, we might think, well, yeah, we serve the right God and everything, and I appreciate that. But they got results from their God, too. So you cannot negate mm -hmm. that they were, be able, they were in a position of, of power as well. And all that we could do is to continue to do according to the, the terms of the covenant. And sometimes that works for us, but it doesn't work for anyone else outside. Adultery. You're talking about... Um, worshiping one god, many gods? Idolatry is worshiping false gods. False gods, okay. Yeah, but we only would know who is false and who is real. And if we don't get a chance to teach you, then you're not going to know, but you I will see. benefit. I think today they call it voodoo or obia. Um, you know, that's where the cross comes into play. And some of the Europeans, they wear the cross on their forehead when they worship. It's black cube, and then others, they unfold it, and it becomes, so one is a cube when it's folded, and when it's unfolded, then it becomes the cross. I know. see. Now, I have to ask, um, in the scriptures, it does mention Christian. Mm -hmm. Is Christian different from Christianity? Yes. How Christ so? Christian is, well, first of all, Christian was spelled C-R-I-T-E-N. Because I think it's uh, French or, or Swiss, one of those um, uh, origins. And it means retard, idiot, stupid, mm. anything like that. Mm -hmm. Because our Israelite forefathers were called Christians at Antioch about the year 50. Notice, they were called Christians by the Gentiles. But the question begs itself, who were they before they were called Christians? And even after they were called Christians? So it's like my throwing the N-word at somebody. You know, it, it doesn't identify them. It's just an insult, you see? So it just, I always find it rather interesting because if they called us Christians in the year 50, then they adopted that name. Now they're using the N-word, right? Are they going to use that word to, as a philosophy, one of their a religious experience? I see. Eventually? And how, how much time is it, is it going to take before they call themselves the N-word? So, yes, um, that word meant retard, and it, it's a, it reflected a medical condition. Mm -hmm. um, it was a thyroid disorder. And the thyroid gland, for those of you that know, if it's overly stimulated, then you can grow up to seven feet tall or yes. higher. If it's under-stimulated, then you become a dwarf. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you've got a dwarf, you have a big head, you got hands that are probably too long for your body. So everything is messed up. And not only that, in, a, in appearance, you not only look unattractive, 
from some people anyway, you also have a mental disorder. So then it, I did this research uh, years ago, and I thought, because I thought the word Christian, the way it is spelled, it's not that bad. But when you understand, it's not that spelling. That's the English version of it. Right. But the original version of it wasn't like that. It's, C, it's French or, or Latin or something, C-R-E-T-I-N. And people, I invite you know, your, your, your audience to take a look and investigate this for themselves and see exactly what I'm saying. Now, what would make them use that term? Good That's question. the question. Yeah. So let's say I remembered when the Romans went into the temple in Jerusalem. It was Titus, I think, I believe. And um, he was looking for the God because how are these people? There's just a handful of people, but they're so, they're so good at fighting, you know? And if they fight in the Roman Empire, come mm. on, guys. And you're making us having second thoughts about the battle at, sometimes. Who is your God? And they went to look because they had Mars and Jupiter and Apollo and Zeus and everybody. Yeah. And when they looked, they went to the temple. There's nothing, no image. At best, there was just a seven branch candlestick. They're like, where's the God? But they took that anyway. Right. Right. And they, they have an arch in, in, in Rome today that reflect that. The key here is how was it then that these people, Israelites, could worship a God that they cannot see. And we, as Gentile Europeans, we have a, dozens of gods, and we got us images for every one of them. That's right. They must be retards. Mm -hmm. They must be Christians. And the only people that they could identify that was, was the people in the Al Alpine reg region uh, that looked strange and acted strange. Israelites back then um, were called Christian as an insult, and Christian is not somebody's identity. That's correct. It's just an insult. That's correct, because it, it brings me to a very, very important point, naming. And this is something that I take extremely serious because I understand the implication. For me to name you, I have to have authority over you right? Whether I'm your father or whatever. I cannot just assign a name without, uh, a name is more than a label, right? Without disrupting your life and so on and so forth. So people have to understand that names are very sacred. They are more than identification. They address the spiritual uh, responsibility of that individual as well. And there's so much that we can talk about that. So when people say Jew or more or what have you, or even the N-word, you know, those are just descriptions. Those are not names. Those are not names. When they say the, uh, the so-called black man or the so-called white man, again, they are no black men. They are no white men, right? So get the identify, identification of that individual. Look at their ancestry. Know what is their nationality. And that's how you address it because therein you're going to see the culture of the individual. You're going to see the purpose of that individual. Then you can appreciate it because maybe that individual could do something using his or her God-given talent to help you. But if you just write them off by throwing uh, some kind of um, negative uh, uh, word at them, and then it gets stuck over time, then you've done yourself a disservice, number one, and number two, you put yourself in a state of ignorance. What do you mean there's no black person or white person? Yes. As, as I said earlier, the Christians of, of Iberia identified their own uh, as see. white people. And then they discredited the Israelites as black people. So with that generalization and having authority over us then and even today, they were able to enforce that. And even you can pick up a textbook today and you will see black people, white people. Mm -hmm. How are you going to determine the nature or the identity of an individual by just looking at them? 
I see. You know, it's impossible. Yes, I could say with a great deal of confidence because I'm, I'm an Israelite, that my father created man from the soil. And for people that may think that I'm joking, go to your local um, store and ask for a bag of humus. You know, go to Home Depot or wherever and get a bag of humus. You will be given the blackest soil that you have ever seen. It is also some of the richest soil that you would ever utilize. So they seem to be then, if you look at the word human, mm. there is that you in there, mm -hmm. right? It's a very, very, very wise and clever um, definition. But the thing here is, yes, the first man and woman, they look like me. Not a problem. But that happened with Shem, these are the children of Noah, mm -hmm. Ham, and Japheth, all the children of Noah. So that's what Noah looked like as well. But that is not the issue. The issue is there's more to it than that. And if you just, just write people off because they have a different appearance, then you, <laughs> you're limiting yourself, number one, because you're demonstrating your level of ignorance that it is extremely high. Look around at the vegetation. Look at the plants. How do they look? Most of the time, they're green, right? And you don't want to eat cabbage or lettuce that is of a different appearance because it, you, you will be robbed of the nutritional value of that plant. You see? So then, when you should be eating the vegetables to gain that, that medicinal, if you will, quality, you're just putting stuff in your system that could hurt your body. You know, look at the fish in the ocean. Look at the birds. They're all different in appearance. And every day, even, is different. Today was a beautiful sunshine day. Yesterday was dark and gloomy. You know, do I just go around and get upset with the days because they don't look the way I want them to look? All I'm suggesting here is that there is so much to learn just by going beyond the surface and getting to appreciate people for whom they really are. But you've got to do a little bit of thinking. You've got to see qualities in individuals. You've got to see something in your own self. Because if you just cast in stones at people, that means you don't like yourself. You, that is called an inferiority complex. And out of that comes hatred, comes violence, comes ignorance and lies. That's not the way you want to go. So not all black people are the same? That is, is that, correct. Okay, so in Africa, you got a mixture of, of a lot of different black races? Well, is I don't even use the term race. Okay. Because when you say race, mm -hmm. I see someone with athletic ability okay. running across the desert or something like that or swimming uh -huh. in a pool, right? Again, these are a Christian inventions, right? Which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So let us look and see, let us say nationality okay. or culture, right? Because we're not running anywhere. And, and, and if you look at what they're doing, they're going backwards. They're not going forward. So there is no race. You see, life itself is a journey. And it's a race that is not for the swift, if you will, but for those that can endure, you know, according to the terms of the, uh, of the length of time. And this is what we're looking at here, more so than whether somebody how is, is of a different complexion. And that's not race. That's a genetic matter, right? But I say, and I know I may be a little strange, in order to understand, draw the blood of the individual, right? Now, I challenge anyone to do that. You can't just go around taking people's blood. But the point is, therein you will see, if you will, that every human being that has ever walked this earth has the blood of a man and a woman that was created from black earth. Every human being, regardless of whatever they look like today. So because you look like somebody else does not mean that you're of the same family. That for, is for true. Example, for example, um, Ishmael. Very you mentioned true. Ishmael. They were a dark race. That is true. 
but yet they weren't friends with, with the Israelites. Okay, you use the term race again. Uh, and there you go, bad yeah. habit. <laughs> the, the, as I said earlier, we have Noah, yeah. and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah was made like his fathers from that same humus, right? And he had the same complexion that reflected that humus that you would get from Home Depot today. And his sons had it. Now, as it, in, as it is in every family today, you know, some siblings are a little bit lighter in complexion, some are a little bit darker, some have longer hair, some have no hair like me. I mean, I used to have hair, mm -hmm. just full disclosure. But the issue is, regardless of what you look like, that does not matter. It is your parents that matter, mm. right? Respect for your mom and your dad is more important than how you perceive yourself today. Because if you show them respect, you will respect yourself also. And all we're saying is you cannot just go by how you look in the mirror. It's, it's who is the guy in the mirror that you're talking about? So you have to do a little bit of thinking little bit of analytical uh, um, investigation. So the Europeans, they didn't have a problem with Israel because of their color. Is it because of their identity? Because... Of who, who they were or are? Okay, that, that probably played a role in it as mm -hmm. well. Because remember I said at the beginning that this is a spiritual endeavor. Yes. Right? And <laughs> the spirit works like this. First, you get the ideas in your head, let's say, right? And then the, those ideas are transmitted to the brain. And then the brain will move the hand or feet or mm -hmm. the organs accordingly. So if the idea that comes to you is evil, then your behavior has to be evil. So what we are t addressing here is, is behavior. And that's how you know who is who. You know, you don't look at a person because of they having, you know, blue eyes or red skin or what have you. Look at their behavior and you can tell who's who. I can say I'm, I, I'm whoever. I'm a giant. But if I don't measure up, then I only make myself look stupid. So who are we? Who is our parent? Who is our father? That's how you know who you are. And the reason I'm saying that is because my father, his gates are open to all, but you have to find the gate because mm -hmm. it's straight and it's very narrow. See, when you're looking at it physically, you know, um, Israel was in Spain. Then they were kicked out. Then from Portugal, they were kicked out again. You could see how you think it's a race thing that these white Europeans don't like these black Israelites and they keep kicking them out of the country, if you look at it physically. Again, that word race I know. doesn't resonate I with know. me. I don't, because I don't see the Europeans running after anybody or, you know, to try it. Because if it were just that, it wouldn't be an issue. But today, people would say because it's a race issue. That's why they were kicked out of these countries. That's why we're here. We're here to mm -hmm. introduce a new way of thinking. Because the old way doesn't work. Doesn't work, yes. Right? Because it is built on lies and falsehoods. So we have to, we're not going to correct that. We just introduce in some, a new concept with the hope that people will start to look at life differently. The idea, as I said before, with the European is the fact that they had to do certain things. Remember, we're looking at, as I said, we're looking at a prescribed judgment made by the God of Israel. And he, as creator of heaven and earth, he had a casting. He casted the children of Shem, the children of Ham, and the children of Japheth to do a particular job. Now, did some of that get contaminated by another guy who was trying to usurp his authority? Yes. Did they find that other guy more appealing than him? Yes. Was that other guy have good intentions? No. So did the other guy know about the Israelites? Yes. 
Was he trying to turn the Israelite away from their father? Yes. All of these are questions that have to be answered. We cannot look at what the neighbor is doing. We have to look at what we are doing. Yes, it may be a little bit difficult because the neighbor is making it a little bit more challenging for us. But there's always a way around it if we can work together. I might not have all the answers, but if I come and sit and talk to you, I might get a few suggestions that I could work with. And then you can go and talk to somebody. And before you know it, we're working as a team. So whereas one person didn't have the solution, now we have 12 people. And the solution is right in front of us. And we take it one day at a time. Now, it doesn't mean that the other guy that doesn't like you or like me is going to change. He might even become more aggressive because he is seeing that regardless of what he does, there is some measure of prosperity, some measure of personal and collective um, development. He doesn't like that, so he has to keep going. The issue is that, as I said, each one has a role to play. Some of those roles are good, some are not so good. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, our objective, or the objective of our father, who has prescribed the judgment, is we've got to be punished for things that we did wrong. And we have to end up in a country that is not known by our forefathers, where we will be served as slaves. We have to have all of this in place before we get there. So we're going to start out with the Mediterranean region of Europe. We're going to move into Iberia. We're going to move into France, southeast France and Provence. We're going to go into Britain. We're going to help to make them strong and powerful. Then the British are going to say, you know what? The world is ours. We can do anything. And they're going to go out and settle. And they settle the, um, Virginia. And once they settle Virginia and they settle Canada and they do all of this, then they, they think that nothing can stop them. In the meantime, in Rome, you had uh, the Vatican, the popes, overthrowing the North African Empire. and, and uh, uh, Sorry, overthrowing the... the, the Phoenicians at Carthage. And then with that, we found that they were inspired to go further. Next thing you know, they set up the papacy, which is their own popes mm-hmm. doing their own thing, rather than listen to us, our forefathers out of Carthage and Numidia. So now they recognize, oh, well, we could sail the world now. And that's where Columbus comes in. Mm-hmm. And of course, he learned from us certain things. Right? Not all of it, the maps he learned, but he learned from the Phoenicians who were good sailors. You see? <laughs> we talked earlier about the, the philosophy of idolatry coming from Egypt and Babylonia. Everyone has a hand. And there is so much that came together uh, in, in Rome and in London, you know, that helped to empower the European. Now he can go out and conquer. Now we have a land ready. It's called Virginia. Right? It wasn't the United States until 1776. It was Virginia. Mm-hmm. And from Canada, the border with Canada to, um, to Florida was called Virginia. Now they can go out and conquer. And Columbus comes, and he does what he has to do. And he inspired others to go beyond, and so on and so forth. And that's how things got out of hand. So all this really started because the Israelites weren't doing what they're supposed to do? That's right. That's it? That's the beginning of this? That's right. But again, wow. it, is, it is not just like you're in your own house here. Mm-hmm. The world belongs to our Father, and he called us to be his inheritors, to be his witnesses, and to be his servants so that we could inherit the earth. We didn't do it. We went after other gods, and he's, okay, so you're like them, huh? Okay, I'm going to give you some time to spend with them. See how you like it. You know, um, I have children, and when they were younger, you would uh, put them in the corner when they're bad. When they get older, you take a phone from them. You take something that they like. You discipline them. So it sounds to me like the God of the Israelites, his form of disciplining is enslavement. Would that be correct? In this case, yes. That's correct, because, okay, it's, there, there's so much to the word in itself, because 
you have to submit to somebody else other than the one you should be submitting to. Mm -hmm. And that's where the bondage comes in. That is where you have the, the, the person or the people you're submitting to have full reign over you. That is why they can name you now, right? Before, when you left to Western Africa, you were Kunta Kinte. Now you get to Virginia, you're Toby. Mm -hmm. And they're going to beat the heck out of you yeah. till you accept that name, Toby. Now Toby is your Christian name. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, Kunta Kinte, which would have meant priest of or priest or prince of earth or whatever. Now, what the hell does, does, does Toby mean? You know, uh, junk, whatever. The important thing here is you can't look at the oppressor. You have to look in the mirror, see right. what it is that we are doing wrong and try to find a way to correct it. That's where sometimes we make the mistakes. Now, like you said, Israel, they migrated to West Africa. They went into Europe. Where else did they touch? Where where else did their feet touch? What other part of land they went into? Their feet touched a lot of different places, of course. Um, they passed through the Greeks. The, I, I like the Hellens more than the Greeks because hell is there. Okay. And um, then they went to Rome, the Roman Empire. Then, like you said, Iberia, France. They went into Britain. And then, of course, they came in initially from Western Africa, and they passed through all of those countries. But you could see that the, the preparation was Western Africa to make this to happen. Because even when they were in Iberia, they were kicked out to places like San Tome, which is off the coast of Western Africa, mm -hmm. north, northern side. And the Cayman Islands and other places. And, and then here's another thing. They went into Iberia under the Islamic banner meaning the Muslims, they did the work, but the Muslims took the credit. Then when the, the empire in Northern Africa, well, it wasn't an empire, but when the, the Supreme Council was destroyed in the, in the fourth century, then the Teutonic tribes came down, wiped out the Roman Empire, and was about to wipe, wipe out Christianity as well, but then they made a deal with them, and they participated in that. But at that point in time, then, more uh, additional Muslims came in from the, from the east. And they came in, they overran Carthage and other places. So you could see all of this happening, right? It's almost like the world is shifting in different yeah. places. And at the center of the shift is the Israelite nation. It kind of revolves around them. Yes. And they, 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 wherever they were kicked out, they weren't allowed to come back because they had to become servants now. And when the land in Virginia was ready, that's where most of them were dragged, kicking and screaming. Now, where do, do the Moors fit in all this? Again, Moors is a name, a, a generalized name. Okay. And that name was there before black man, so-called. So the Europeans, in their ignorance, would call anyone that looked like me a Moor. I see. You see? And that would include Israelites. That would include some of the descendants of the children of Ham. That would include some of the descendants of the Assyrians and the Phoenicians, of course, and so on. A person, um, I forgot his name now, like um, Hannibal would be considered a Moor. Mm -hmm. And you know what Hannibal did to the Roman Empire, but he was not an Israelite. Oh. You see, he, he was from Canaan, a kind of Phoenician. And so all of these things were there, but again, it reflects the, the, um, the, the ignorance of the European. With you think they did this to, on purpose, though? <laughs> to destroy they, their identity? It's, I don't know whether they did it or not. They did it for their own satisfaction mm. because... At the point of, okay, put yourself in the, in the position of a European and you want to have power. Everybody that is there would have to be dumbed down. And the more, the, the more names that you could throw at them, that whereby they would lose their national identity and yes. responsibility, then the better 
for the European because these guys eventually are going to lose some of their very um, essence. Now, we're in Portugal. It's in the 1700s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Inquisition. Is that the date, the 1700s? Well, it started earlier than that. It goes back to the 12th century. 12th century, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. So what uh, was happening? Now, it may have been in Portugal at that time, mm-hmm. but before, when it first started, it, it started around the 12th century. And it just moved. Wherever the Israelites were, that's where the Inquisition went. Because as we said, we had to determine who's who. Because now you're getting a, a certain level of secrecy here. As they gain in power, they don't want to share all that information. You know, I tell people I did not know until recently that there were certain Europeans, these are the Khazars, that wore that uh, cross on their forehead. I used to see, because I have friends that are Khazars, and they would have that little black cube, Mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't know what that was until I did my investigation. And then when it's unfolded, it became a cross. So the Khazar, who was practicing Judaism and Christianity, they served the same God, which is Saturn or Satan, according to what my friend tells me. So the whole idea here, and I don't criticize them, trust me, I, I'm fine with whatever you, who you want to serve. The whole idea here is that everyone has to do according to their understanding, Right? And there's a certain high-level secrecy as you get higher in that, uh, that little community, if you will. Mm-hmm. People do things that are done internally. You might just see it from external positions, but you will not understand what it is they're doing unless you're part of their society. And it doesn't mean that you have to do all of that. You just... Okay, it works for them. It doesn't work for me. That's fine. I have my own. We have secrets in Israel that we don't share with the world, right? And I like that. But at the same time, we don't condemn the world either. Now, you mentioned the Khazars. Mm-hmm. Now, it seems to me like as the Israelites were being thrown out of country, out of country, out of country, they were setting up shop in the Israelites' land which is Israel, under the radar, Well, and building their, their community. That's fine. You know, and it's, a, and it's a good point. A lot of people today would criticize them. I'm not one of them. Because if I jo- walk down the street and I saw a $100 bill, I'd pick it up, dust it off, and put it in my pocket. Now, what am I going to do? Just go around and and ask everyone, oh, did you drop a $100 bill? (laughs) Sure, the first guy will say yes, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, whether he did or not. The point is, the land was available. And if they want to take it, knock themselves out. What I will tell you, if they had asked me, though, before they took it, I would say, don't do it. Mm -hmm. I would say, come with us. Let us tell you, let us teach you, so that you don't make that mistake. I see. Because there's a lot of stuff there, and if you notice, if you go back, there's been war after war after war after war. In other words, no peace. But no one has asked me anything, so I'm not in a position to tell anything. So I say, well, if you find a a piece of free land and you can get it, that's on you. But This is is like the new way of thinking you 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 were mentioning earlier. Yes. Where... I'm going to use the word black man. That's on your wrist. That's on my wrist. He would blame everything on somebody else. The white man did this, the white man did this. But you are saying, I got to look in the mirror and say, uh, the Khazars are there in that land because I screwed up. My forefather screwed up. If it wasn't for that, we would have been occupying that land. We would have been more. We would have been this. We would have been that. Is that fair to say? That's reasonable, yes, because... We are the ones that polluted the land through our disobedience to our father to the point, and this is why we come back again to that melanin situation where the land, if once you are made from the land, created from the land, then you have a connection with the land. If, you, if the land find you unbearable, it can kick you out. 
Mm-hmm. I know that sounds a little strange to people, but again, it is true. It will kick you out, especially if you are serving the one who created the land. <laughs> if you're not serving the one who created the land, the land is okay, well, whatever, right? But the land and the water and everything around you was made or for your well-being as an Israelite. And if you violate that precept, then it is not just that you did one thing all around you. Because if you, if you look at the book, you will see where when we do good, we reap blessings. Our crops are, bent, are plentiful, right? Uh, if we don't do well, then things start to change around us. Maybe there's no rain. If there's no rain, you can't eat. If you can't eat, you get sick, and so on and so forth. So the best thing for us to do as the chosen people is to understand, first of all, who chose us and for what reason. Once we get that, then we will know how to serve him correctly. And once we serve him correctly, we will benefit from his his wisdom. But if we don't do that, then we have a problem, and you don't want to mess with him. Now, it seems like the Portuguese, while they're going through this whole campaign, seeking and looking for the Israelites and throwing them out, there are, there's also these tall ships arriving in the west coast of Africa, capturing, stealing, kidnapping Israelites as well and bringing them to the, the Caribbeans. Uh, you said Georgia because uh, America wasn't Virginia. America. Yeah, Virginia, sorry, Virginia. Uh, the UK. What was the, or who was, who started the Atlantic slave trade around this time? You know, to be precise, I probably don't have that information right at the tip of my tongue, but I will say that there has to be something here that is very, very special and unique. Remember, and I have to keep reminding you about this, we're, we're in a high spiritual zone here. How is it then that you have a total different people working together to commit this crime, if you will, or to partake of this crime against humanity? What do you mean by that, different that, people? The slave trade. And the, the different people that I'm talking yeah. about, you have the Ishmaelites, who mm-hmm. are of Semitic, Shemitic origin, the same as the Israelites, right? Who are partnering I see. with Christianity, the Europeans, who are primarily the Japhetic origin. Yeah, you don't hear much of that. Exactly. And even you have another European... Gentile, right, uh, of the Khazars, who were financing some of the tra- oh. transactions. They're working together as a team. The question is, what would bring these different people together? Mm-hmm. And you have to see that there's a different spiritual uh, component there, working in the midst of them, pushing them forward to do this, because they are believing in their hearts, that this is going to be advantageous to them. Maybe it will be immediately, but the long term, there's always a price to pay. Not knowing that they are pawns in the big scheme? Perfect example. Okay. Pawns in the game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and they're going through. But the question goes a little bit deeper than that. How is it then that these people are fighting amongst themselves for power? Christianity fought two wars. Well, two major ones. They probably fought hundreds of them. You have the first Christian war and the second Christian war, right? And you have a lot of these players, the same players are involved, right? It is is not something that is is strictly, you know, for Europeans. When I grew up, most of Eastern Europe was Islamic. As Islamic today as Iraq or Iran or Saudi Arabia or anywhere. Mm -hmm. Right, but these people didn't look like me or look like the the Muslims in those regions. You see, and there was a time when the Vatican had issues with the um, the Templars 
who were a secret Masonic order, structure, because they were, let's say, in bed with the Muslims and not with the Christians. This is the Vatican. What I'm trying to emphasize is the spiritual component that everybody overlooks. It doesn't matter what you call yourself or how you name yourself. It's who you're serving. You see what I'm saying? And, and this is what everybody, they seem to forget, that there's a battle raging, but the battle is within. And we have to look carefully at our behavioral patterns in order to make a measure of correction. Because if you don't see that in order to punch somebody, you have to hurt yourself. You have to feel inferior to that person. To call somebody names, you've got to get angry. What's causing you to be angry? Is that an evil spirit that is possessing your being and transmitting to your brain and your brain transmitting to your fist and you're pulling a gun or whatever? These are issues that we have to start to think about. You know, it's funny because the, the Europeans, they could have just hopped right over the Mediterranean Sea to Africa and enslave anybody they wanted. But yet they, they, they chose to travel all the way around to the west coast of Africa. So it tells me that they're not in control. It tells mm. me that they were deceived mm. before they were able to come out and deceive other people. It tells me that they had to somebody or something had to appeal to their personal or individual or collective vanity to let them feel important. It sounds to me like they are suffering from a mental disorder. And I'm not uh, um, a doctor, or at least not a medical doctor. The real doctor, as you know, is spiritual, mm. yeah. right? And, and they were all Israelites. But that medical disorder calls for serious, serious treatment because that's where schizophrenia comes in. That's, the, that's where neurotic disorders come in. And you can see that by people who pretend to be more than they really are. But on the surface, most people can't see it. It is only when you stop and think about it. We had a good display yesterday in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. you know, but that's a whole different matter. People do not understand the environment that they are living in. All they look at is me, me, me. They never think about us. Mm. They never see that take a week, for instance, seven days. Every day is different. You know, So you cannot lump them together. You've got to look at what each day is providing. Then 12 months in a year. Why? Why can't we just have summer and, and be done with it? There, there's got to be more wisdom associated with these things that people can't understand. So what I'm getting at is the differences, the physical differences play a big role that we should embrace as individuals. But we have to learn to be comfortable with self. If we are miserable when we look in the mirror, then it's not going to work when you look out your window. It also seems to me that these different nations, uh, the Khazars, Islam, the Christians, their role wasn't done yet. Even though they kicked them out of the country, they still went at the Israelites. It's like there's no rest for the Israelites, no matter what. What, what is the remedy for the children of Israel today? The remedy is a very simple one, but it requires a lot of discipline. And today, discipline is not a major factor that is, that is taught. Before, before that, who are the Israelites today? Just clear that up for me, and then you can continue. Yes. As we said earlier, these are the children, the descendants of the children of slavery. Okay. Right? Primarily, because I don't know of any people, any other people, who fit the profile. Because we have, as I said, a mandate that has been issued because a judgment has been passed. And that has to be fulfilled. The entire world had to, be, had to be conditioned. You could ask yourself, if you learn how to sail a ship, why did you not sail the ship and got food? Why did you have to go and steal people's mm -hmm. lives? 
You know, why did you not go and learn how to plant cotton? Or, and, and, and don't tell me you didn't know who these people really are. Because <clears throat> if you look today, and, I, and, and, and I'll, I'll go fast forward a little bit here, at the end of our 400 years, or just prior, like five years before, one of the major events that took place in both Canada and the United States, and I'm sure probably some European countries as well, was the legalization of drugs, marijuana. Yes. Why? All these t years in the past, you were putting individuals in jail and treating them with total disdain and disrespect, right? They had 40 years, whatever, whatever, for whatever. I don't, I don't know about drugs, so I don't know. But <clears throat> the point I'm making is how is it that just before the end of our 400 years of enslavement, we find that the drugs that normally would put us in jail as yeah. punishment are now you can buy them from your local stores. How is that possible? Unless somebody knows something about us. Meaning? Meaning we were not the first to know that we are Israelites. Elder Shadrach, my teacher, was not the first to know that we, the children of slavery, are indeed the children of Israel. So drugs were made legal so the Israelites can consume it and even lose more of their identity or get... I'm not making that statement. Okay. But I'm asking that people think about it. Okay. To see if you're 400 years in jail, the drugs that are now you can buy on the street legally put you in jail. It seems to me, my rationale... I see. ...would be that someone knows something about you that you don't know about yourself. Those are the drugs, and these are not drugs that you could, and I don't know, but this is what I've heard. You, you could, you know pick up one from a tree or whatever and smoke it and you'll be fine. I don't know. I still think it's a bad idea. Um, drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. bad idea. But if these are now laced with all types of chemicals, so they affect your mind. Yes. And they will keep you a slave, even though the shackles are no longer on your legs. You see what I'm saying? Now the mental slavery continues. So what I'm saying to individuals, rather than point fingers, look in the mirror and see why do you allow others to dictate your behavior. I don't care if they put a dozen liquor stores in my neighborhood. I don't have to buy any liquor. They'll go to business real quick. You know. So you can't criticize them. This is something they, they did, the, the um, uh, children of slavery in, in the United States in the South, when I was there, used to complain about. You don't have to buy their liquor just because it's in the store. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy their cigarettes just because they put them in your neighborhood. Trust me, they will move them quickly because their idea is to make money and make it quick. Right. So if they bring drugs in your neighborhood, <clears throat> sorry, but you don't have to go out and, and say anything. Just teach your children. This is bad. Don't do it. Is this why the black... Oh, I was just about to children fall into... Children of slavery, I know. What children of slavery, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, is being treated the way they are even till this day? It's, it's a learned behavior, mm -hmm. even by those that oppress them. And it is difficult to bring an end to that. However, you know, I, I always say that we live under um, a, a slave-based economy. The entire economic structure is based on slavery because the children of slavery laid the platform, they built it, as uh, uh, to no benefit of their own. And everyone now benefits at their expense, okay? So you don't really want to change that if you are of European descent. No. Because that's, that, that's how you make your billions, right? And I say, if you can make $1 billion from slavery, think of the trillions of dollars you can make from freedom. Hmm. Trillions. That's just me, though, because slavery is confining. It's limitation. The individual is not allowed to use his God-given talent. But once that individual now, you could sponsor that individual. You could sponsor him and say, you know what? I'll give you $100. I want 50%. You know, ever watch Shark Tank or whatever? Yes. That's what they do. I want 50%. And then you go back and forth. You end up getting maybe 30 or 40 with a 
with a bonus every five years, right? And that's just one beginning. And once that goes successfully, uh, start to go successful, you get more and more and more. Why? Freedom. You see, mm -hmm. that's the key. And in order to do that, then you have to think freedom. But you cannot get free unless you are a product of the truth because the truth will set you free. And it just so happened that the person you enslave would be the one that has the truth. The challenge is, does that person recognize it? And are they willing to share it with you? So the, the point I'm making here is when the day of judgment comes, what are you going to say? As a descendant of the European who've enslaved the children of the king of the heaven and earth, how are you going to say, I didn't know? Right. You can't say that. You knew who they were. Who they were. Yes. They sang the Negro spirituals, which are all biblical. You knew something was up. Mm -hmm. They couldn't read and write when they were singing, right? So why did you take the children of the Almighty King of all kings and put them to pick cotton and tobacco? Yeah. They they knew. They they had a relationship with them for of many, course. many years in Europe. Yeah. They knew exactly who they were. You should have got those people and say, you know what? Your father sent you over here to be a servant. I'm going to let you be a servant. Hmm. But you know what? I'm going to cook a meal for you in the morning and in the afternoon. Make sure you're fed and, prop and have clothes for you. Why? I don't want to go against your father because I recognize who he is. I will still put you through. No shackles, right? I'll make sure you have good living quarters. Uh, you're not going to get paid. You'll get fed and you'll get your clothes and so on, right? Now, of course... That's rational thinking, but that's not the way they thought, mm. right? It, it, they just worked you from sunrise yeah. to sunset. They, whether you were naked or not, didn't really matter. As long as you were making a profit, I was making a profit, and you were causing that profit to, be, to grow every year, and so on. So what they were telling me, even as a slave, was that they're dumb. They're stupid. But of course, at the time, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And they obviously didn't know either. Because if they knew, they would not have done that. But they fell prey to deception. They felt weak and insecure. They had an inferiority complex. That's why they're so violent and so angry. You think they went overboard with uh, brutality? Of course they went overboard in, for brutality. Why would you hang an innocent person? Yeah. Uh, just because someone... <laughs> look, forget that part. Look today, and you will see a situation, and I, I've, I've examined some of these situations very carefully, you know, while I was in, in, a, in Atlanta, and I would see the police officer who was on the force for 40 years, and he couldn't tell the taser from his gun. He pulled the gun and shot the guy in the back oh, wow. when he wanted to taser the guy. So things like that, you could see that the police officer was there physically, but the one that was controlling him wasn't, he, he was not in control, in other words. Mm -hmm. So when you see things like that, you, you go, wow, at least I have the eyes to see what's going on. So all, these things are not physical. And that's why I always say black lives would only matter when you understand or remember the 400. If you don't remember the 400 years of slavery, black lives don't matter. That's the point that is hard for people to appreciate and to use to progress and make a difference. Now, the 400 years, has it been up already? Yes. 20, well, from 1619 to 2019. But the important point to remember is that our, our year doesn't go from January to December. Okay. Our year is from spring to spring. I see. Yeah. I see. So 2020 would have been, uh, the spring of 2020 would have been the end of the 400 years or the beginning of it. First year of freedom. Now, you said to remember the 400 years. Yes. What do you mean by that? Because every every um, Black History Month, they always talk about the enslavement. That's the beginning of the children of Israel's history, pretty much. They come in ships. That's the beginning. Nobody goes further back and sees and see where they came from beyond that point. It always starts um, at the time of slavery. So what do you mean look, look at or remember the 400? 
Shouldn't they be looking further back to see where their ancestors really came from? Well, I think they will they will accomplish that by okay. remembering the 400. However, but the, the so-called Black History Month is, is a mess. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with even the children of slavery because that that the intentions of it were cordial and they were friends doing things had nothing to do with the history of a people and february is the shortest month of the yeah. year it's the coldest not a pleasant time what happened to august yeah august is perfect and this is when we can learn about people like john brown william wilberforce who made the sacrifice for us when we weren't able to make that sacrifice or make that effort when we will learn about the negro spirituals and the impact that they have had not only on the United States, but all the way around and people and the character of the individuals. There's so much to learn. But when you look back at the 400 years, first of all, you will see why we were made slaves, right? And the duration of the slave, uh, of this enslavement, and how we could turn that around once that time is up. You know, all of this could prepare us to do or make a meaningful contribution in the next 400 years. And if we could do that, I think coming together to be one, because we are one nation, we just don't know it. Mm. But just saying that doesn't make it happen. The individuals have to recognize it, understand it, and take steps to make it a reality. I see. Can you touch upon the migration of Israel into Carthage? Yes, that's, that's a very important um, region as far as Israelite migration is concerned, because Carthage was settled again. I have to go back to the to the spiritual component of this whole thing. Remember when we went into the Promised Land, there was already occupied the Canaanites in that land. It just so happened that when Joshua came in, and I don't want to get into a lot of stuff uh, biblically, that they fled to northern Africa, mm-hmm. the the a lot of the Canaanites, and. When we were being challenged and after, you know, in the time of the apostles, a lot of the Israelites fled to North Africa, to Carthage as well. Now, as we said before, that's where Hannibal challenged the Roman Empire. And when I used to study this when I was younger, I was always wonder, I was wondered why is it that Carthage being more powerful than Rome? when you consider the exploits of Hannibal, but yet Rome defeated Carthage. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that Hannibal went in and he he was a tough guy and he did whatever he wanted to do in Rome and they couldn't touch him. But the Romans were able to use some of his own people to betray him and to fight against him. Now, in the meantime, our forefathers, our Israelite forefathers had established the Supreme Council of Israel in that region. Mm -hmm. And they, as I said before, had continued to administer the bishops of the region of the Mediterranean, even the Rome to to Rome itself. And then things went about the 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 fourth century, things started to take a turn for the worse. After the time of Constantine, about 325, the Romans started to put in place a political structure that incorporated idolatry with politics and economics. Mm -hmm. The whole social structure then became the the philosophy of of whatever the idolatry, which, as we said earlier, they followed the teaching of the Babylonians and the Egyptians. A lot of this was Mm -hmm. facilitated by the Canaanites or the Phoenicians because... If you look at the the map of Rome, uh, of Italy, you will see that the northern portion was settled primarily by the Etruscans, who were from Babylon. They were Assyrians. And the southern portion was settled by the Phoenicians, or the Canaanites. And you can tell a lot about the name, but I don't want to get into all that. Anyway, they, they set up the papacy or they set up the the cardinal structure of the papacy. So you had in place not only the political structure from Constantine, but the spiritual structure from the Assyrians and supported by the Canaanites 
under the name of Phoenicians. The only um, objection came from the Israelites in North Africa around Carthage and Numidia. Okay. And they did something that was completely different from what the Romans were doing. Obviously, that would create a conflict. And as the Romans started to get stronger and stronger and the papacy started to grow and, in, and you have put, they put a betrayer, someone to betray um, the Israelites within the, um, the capital, so to speak, which is the capital is the temple of Saturn where they worship the different gods, mm -hmm. and that was in Rome. Then things took a turn for the worst. And after going back and forth over time, they had enough power, the Catholics then, to step in and use military force, amongst other things, to force the Israelites to stop what they were doing, even if they did not want to continue uh, to, to, start to serve the gods of the Romans. They had to at least say, well, you can't do that anymore. They did that through violence. They burned them at the stake. They um, beheaded many of them. They burnt the Bibles that were translated in Latin back in the day because Latin was called the ecclesiastical language, meaning the priestly language of the Israelites. And even Jerome, I don't know if you remember him, he had to translate from Latin into the vulgar Latin, and hence it was called the Vulgate mm -hmm. because the Romans could not read it. It was too high for them. Mm -hmm. All of this occurred between the 3rd and the 5th century. After the demise of our Israelite forefathers from Numidia and Carthage, big things started to happen. We had the Teutonic tribes north of Germany, and they came down upon the Roman Empire and destroyed it. The Teutonics were barbarians. In other words, they were totally ignorant, but my friend, they could fight. Mm -hmm. The best military in all of Europe. And they demolished that entire Roman Empire. It was almost like the hand of God was, was moving them to do this. Don't know. But at the end of the result in the fourth century, Christianity had made, gone through some major, or what I call Christianity today, because it, was, it, it wasn't named Christianity yet, it was still idolatry, it went through some major changes, whereby they had to move the headquarters from Rome to Constantinople in the east. When that occurred, and, th and that occurred because of the Teutonics and the Khazars coming down upon them, when that occurred, then the Muslims came in from the east, and overrun Constantinople. Then they had to move it from Constantinople, that is the headquarters of this idolatry, to Russia, to St. Petersburg, Russia. So now you have the Teutonics who have inherited Christianity by making deals with the papacy. They now, they send in the Goths, the Huns, the Angles, the Vikings, the Saxons, there's many of them, many different tribes. And if you watch the Game of Thrones or yeah. the Vikings, you will see what I'm talking about. Excellent when it comes to military, but when it comes to brain power, zero, mm -hmm. nothing. But they did a great job. And so you had these two, one um, primarily uh, um, Japhetic, which would be the Teuton, the Teutons, and then the Muslims, uh, Shem, Shemetic, and they're coming in, and they almost destroyed all of Europe. Almost. Remember I said mm -hmm. that when I was a boy, there were Muslim territories, Czechoslovakia, and Lith Lithuania, and all those places in the Eastern Europe at the time of the uh, Soviet Union that were full-fledged Islamic back then, just as if you had gone to Iran or, or, or Iraq. So suddenly, our forefathers now are no longer a force to be reckoned with in Europe. But now you have to deal, like, as I said, with these other people who are going to support the Vatican. And they did. And they are still doing it until this day. So all of that occurred. Our forefathers had to flee across the desert. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, some of them coming also from Spain and Portugal for their lives. 
to get out of that region because now they are the enemy. And when they got to Western Africa, of course, they became fodder for Islam and Christianity to be sold into slavery. And that, that, was a ma that occurred uh, shortly after the fifth century. But even before that, or during that process, they, the, there were many battles fought between the Muslims and the Israelites. And today I always remember Fez, and I think Fez is a city in, in Morocco, if I, if I get my, um, my, um, geography, my geography correct, but it was at Fez where the Muslims issued the decree or the edict, convert or die. Mm. That was a statement that was made to the Israelites that were living there at the time. And they had lived there, like I said, way back from the time of the apostles until now. And <clears throat> convert or die, and those that did not convert were slaughtered. Wow. And the Muslims, they took their turbans off and dipped it in the blood of the Fez. And that is even today, if you are a good Mason, you wore a red turban or a red Fez, as they call it. You even carry, the, you dress like, Muslim. You even carry the, the little sword, or what do they call that? I'm not sure, as, as the Muslims did back in the day. So hence, you can see that relationship between Islam and Christianity. And, and it is still there, and you can put Judaism in the midst of that. And it is, it is strong now. It might appear, if you watch CNN, that it is not strong, but it is very, very strong. And a lot of people don't understand it. It is so strong that for many years, if you study Freemasonry, you will see that the Masonic head of the Israelis is not a Gentile European like the others. Mm. He is Arab, and he's not the first. Mm. And I always remembered back in the day when the Israelis captured Jerusalem, that at Mason Hall in London, there were Muslims and those that practice Judaism, celebrating, toasting. And you have to ask yourself, why? I mean, that's none of my business. I'm just saying it because it came out of all of this destruction of our forefathers of North Africa. And I see a lot, but I don't say anything because it's none of my business. My interest is strictly on Israel, not the Israelis, you see? And this is where I'm able to draw the line and be comfortable, because everybody wants to be an Israelite. Everybody wants, but they don't want to follow the instructions mm -hmm. of what it takes to become an Israelite. And they want to be an Israelite because they know that our doors are open to everybody. Once you can find your way, you can come and we will teach you. It doesn't care what you look like or how much money you got or if you don't have any money. But you have to follow the instructions as given by Moses to, well, given by the God of Israel to Moses right. to give to our forefathers. And that's how it is. Now, you said uh, the Masons. When I see them, I see a lot of Egyptian symbolisms. And I also find it in the Roman Catholic. Why is there so many pyramids and ob obelisks in these different philosophies, let's just call it? It is there for a reason. If, if you follow the teaching of masonry, mm -hmm. if you follow the teaching of Christianity, if you follow the teaching of Islam, if you follow the teaching of Judaism, there is one thing that they all have in common, and that is the philosophy of the Kabbalah, which is an Egyptian Babylonian structure. So they have to serve the God. They all celebrate, whether it's Festival of Lights, whether it's uh, Christmas, whether it's um, Hanukkah. Why is it all at that same time? Why does everybody get together and do what they got to do? Again, I'm not here to criticize anybody. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you one thing. I admire them. I really do. Because I always say, if we are children of slavery can get 10% of the discipline that they have when they're serving their God, 
we would be one of the most powerful nations on this earth. And when I say power, not power to do evil, power to do good. You see? Because they make no mistake. You know, come December 25th, everybody got their trees up. It doesn't matter if you're Islamic or Hindu or Sikh or Judaism. They, they may not put up a trees. They may put up a nine-branch candle, different colors. You know, it, it, they do what they have to do. <clears throat> and I respect and admire that. So their powerhouse or their God is the same source. Same is that, source. Okay. You know, that's why it's called the Saturnalia. And, and it's called the Saturnalia for a reason, because the God is Saturn. Oh. And how convenient is Saturn to Satan? Mm-hmm. It all depends on your accent, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't speak Hebrew. The reason why I mention these things, again, we don't criticize, but we don't compromise either. But we are in this world, but we are not of the world. And you would find, if you turn on your television, a lot of news about these nations, but nothing about us. As I said earlier, the headquarters of what is now called Christianity went from Rome to Constantinople to St. Petersburg. And I always find that that Petersburg is is very uh, interesting because Rome, the would say that it was Peter, the mm. apostle, that was, that's a lie. Mm-hmm. Peter never set foot in the world, in that place. But I'll tell you who set foot there. Simon Magus, or Simon the sorcerer. But I'm not going to get into that right now. He was the one that set the spiritual tone, and he had a lot of his education from Alexandria, Egypt. He was a god to them, and there's evidence there to prove it, but that's a whole different story. And then it went to Constantinople, Constantinople. And if you haven't seen the Pope and the Bishop of Constantinople, you will see there's some similarities, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how that guy could have a, a staff with two serpents. Right. It, it just, anyway, like I said, I'm not here to criticize. Just fasc, it's just fascinating. And then St. Petersburg, Russia. Now, remember I said that they fought two major wars, yes. right? And the wars, if you look at the structure, and I invite your listeners or your viewers to go back and and take a look, and you will see when Russia was under the 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 head the head of the Soviet Union, that there were a lot of wars for or a lot of what should I say discontent between different states in Europe and the, the Americas, et cetera, and in, in the East and so on. What I'm here to say, a different way of thinking, a new way of thinking, as a matter of fact, is that all of those wars were fought for spiritual reasons. Because everybody wanted Russia to give up the authority back to Rome. And the Russians would say, you know what? The first Rome fell, the second Rome fell, but the third Rome is still standing. And again, investigate this. And they refused to give it up. So they say, back in the day when, when Hitler came into power, he came to set up the third, was it the, the third or the second? I forgot. The third Christian Reich, I think. And the Reich was empire. And he, you know, again, we can get into all this, but we just keep it short. In other words, he wanted to establish the third Christian empire and he wanted to do it out of Germany, with Germany as, as the headquarters, or at least having some major impact thereof. And he was correct in what he wanted to do. That is he's absolutely accurate, because the, the priesthood was based initially at Rome, but all the princes came from Germany. So he was correct and what he was doing under that spiritual and political protocol. And obviously the Russians said, uh-uh, we're not giving up. Because I I'm, I'm guess if you have the headquarters in your neighborhood or you're responsible, you get some kind of privileges, you know, and nothing like cash when it comes to privileges, right? Mm-hmm. So 
I, I have to side with them on this matter. Not that I am involved. I'm just saying it makes sense. But even today, all I'm saying is there's that animosity that prevails between the different European countries, the Americas, etc., because of that spiritual impact that occurred way back when, when everybody was trying to overthrow our forefathers, to be the head rather than the tail, and to, to benefit accordingly. So I'm, I'm saying that because they took advantage of an opportunity, they're now stuck in that same mode of deception that, and, and hatred and violence that they can't get out of. And yes, we are caught up because we are citizens in these countries, but it is good, always good to know why there's so much a conflict that has nothing to do with us today, but may have started back in the day when things were different. You spoke about all these different nations that had power and the wars they fought. Who's in power now? You know, now is a very, very uncertain time. Mm -hmm. And we have people in the United States who are claiming power, but then there are people in Europe who are claiming power. They're the Chinese are claiming power. The Russians are claiming power. Even in the East, we have other nations that are smaller that are claiming power. But I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the umbrella that they're all under. I see. And, and that tells you something, that they themselves are being deceived. And the reason I'm saying this is not because I want to criticize them. I want our people, our Israelite uh, children, not to follow in their footsteps, to stay away from that. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And regardless of what they're doing, they're not serving our God. So we have to understand that this is the reason why we went through the process of the migration from Jerusalem to Virginia. And now that our time is up, we can't go back to Jerusalem, but we could go back to our father because he controls everything. So this spiritual warfare and this chess game is still being played today. Still being played. It's, it's, they can't get out of it mm -hmm. because you have to sign a, a contract. You know, uh, sometimes we look at some of the, um, the entertainers and we wonder why are they behaving the way they're right. behaving. It's because they signed the contract. You've got to watch what you do, right? And I don't want to call any names, but there were some that I used to enjoy listening to. Some of the ladies were very attractive to look at. Mm -hmm. But when I see what I saw uh, them doing and saying, I had to turn away. What I hear some of the rap tunes that have nothing to do with our progression, I have to turn them off. You know, um, we, we didn't get into the fact about, we talked about how we, we helped to empower the nations, but if you ever go to London and you Trafalgar Square, and then you go up to your friend uh, Elizabeth, say, tell, tell her hello, and you walked in and look up on the right-hand side as you get into the the... First of all, you'll see the change in the cobblestone. And then, okay, if you have a spiritual eye, you'll know why, but I'm not going to say it. Okay. And then when you look up, you see this Assyrian god. He's got wings. He's naked. You see? So when I saw him, I was like, wow, this is Assyria. Mm. He's right at the entrance to the path, the Buckingham Palace. So they just recycle these old gods. Is that the reason why you look in America, you see a lot of Egyptian uh, obelisks That's and the key. pyramids? They're that, using that same old spirit of, of Egypt of old? That's the key. And the, the, the European does not understand that he is a deceived. He's a vessel, and he's been deceived. And, but he benefits from that deception. So it's going to be difficult for you or I to tell him not to do what he does. And some of them are very good at it, too. <clears throat> the key here is we don't really want to be judgmental. We just want to be aware of what's happening. And we see a lot of this going on. 
And we understand some of the, the, the struggles. But most importantly, we understand that there is going to be a day of judgment or an era of judgment, right? Everyone is going to be accountable for their behavior. And I don't know how the creator is going to judge. All I know is he is, he is going to judge. And if we want to know, we could look back at the ancient, look at Babylon mm -hmm. and what he did to that place. It's no longer. But one can say that same spirit that was there has found its way over here. Like you said, yeah. the obelisk, you can't set up an obelisk and just put it up as, as, a, as a symbol of nothing. With that obelisk comes the spirit of the Egyptian. When you put up the cross comes the spirit of the Egyptian and the Babylonian. When you put the cube on your forehead, the spirit of Saturn is there, or Satan. But people sometimes, they don't think about these things because the benefits are so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. what's, what's a little spirit when you've got 10 billion in the bank? You can work it out, <clears throat> you see? These things are very, very, very important to be aware of. You, you and I, we don't have to try to deter that type of behavior. We just have to shut it out from the contents of our material, from our homes, for example, and teach our children. Because today, all the children, even our children, are suspect when they're out there in the world. Everything now is on your phone, right? You don't have to go to the temple anymore, right? It's right there. It's in the music you listen to. And the people that are making the music that looks, they look like me, they're not aware. Because sometimes they are told what to say, how to do it. And if you look at this repetition, there's a lot to be said for that. Because when these things are repeated over and over and over, they're not the lyrics of the days of old when they had a storyline. It's just repetition. They go right into your mental faculties, into your spiritual zone. Then you have no control. And add to that the drugs and the fashion and everything else, you're messed up. But who am I to tell them what to do and what not to do? My job is to show them that there's a new way of thinking, that there is a God that we serve that created the heavens and the earth, and that he is worthy of our worship and praises, if we can take the time to dedicate towards his glorification, don't matter who you are or where you come from or what you look like, you can benefit tremendously. But if you follow everybody else, at your expense, you cannot gain. It's as simple as that. And I know there are many people that would disagree with me, but they can never prove me wrong. And I say to them, Respectfully, I do not seek your agreement, but I insist on your understanding. And I do this for your benefit because only then would you make yourself look smart. Because how are you going to disagree with something you don't understand? The Israelites, it seemed that they were beaten or put to death if they, weren't, if they did not convert to Islam or Christianity. All right? And like you said, this is a spiritual warfare. And these are spiritual institutions. So now, 2021, you have Israelites that are not true to themselves, identity-wise. They're called by all kinds of names. Then they're not Israelites. Well, yes, and on top of that, they are actually in the institutions that enslave them. They're part of them. They worship their gods. This is another thing that I find intolerable. Uh, people will say they, they'll demonstrate and shout if, if an if a officer, police officer kills another child of slavery, however it's done then there's demonstrations every day for a month or whatever. Fine, I don't have a problem with that. But then a guy that looks like me, that kills a guy that looks like me, there are no demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Why? How is it that black lives matter when a person 
that looks like me is killed by another person that does not look like me. But when a person, and there's more of the latter than the former, mm -hmm. black lives don't matter? I call that hypocrisy. I also say to some of these people, the children of slavery, you're demonstrating against a police officer who did whatever he did. I'm not saying he did it correctly. But come Sunday, you're going to pass him right. up the grave, in the graveyard to get to that shrine, mm -hmm. to worship and bow down before that stinking cross. I call that hypocrisy. How can you be saying these things and doing something that is completely different? You're killing your soul, but when somebody else does it, you get upset. doesn't make any sense. Then there are others, like you said, who may call themselves by the name of Israel or whatever, but they're trying to speak languages that somebody, some other Gentile European is speaking. That is not even biblical. And they're using names that are not even in the book. And I'm like, where's the justification? So their behavior is different from what is written in the book. That, to me, also is hypocrisy. Because you cannot follow the enemy and expect to serve the God that we serve, or the God of the book. If you find yourself in a position where you have to name yourself, in other words, your name is not known by our forefathers of old, then you can be guaranteed that you are wrong. And for me personally, those people who name themselves don't matter. Why? Because that tells me that they're not at home. It's just dead man walking. In other words, the spirit is not connected to the body, or maybe it is, but the spirit is not working in the primary interest or, or the, the productive interest of the body. So why would you adopt a new spirit when your father has already given you all that you need? Why not follow the instructions of your parents? You see? So this is the point I'm, I'm making when people take it upon themselves to name themselves. It's, it's, they, they reveal so much about themselves. So I put those people away. I want nothing to do with them. Because then come following that name, the pattern that is exhibited on a daily basis is not conducive to the instructions that are given in the covenant that are with our forefathers. As a matter of fact, it is contrary. And then when you really analyze these people later, you will see that they are actually following somebody else other than the word that was given in the covenant. Are you saying as an adult, I should not change my name to something else that my parents gave me? That is correct. Okay. You should not change your name. Because then, first of all, it's disrespectful to your parents because your parents called you Rob for a reason. And... You know, you, you, you may represent um, some productive guy, some guy of tremendous impact in your society. Sometimes these things don't happen right away. Okay, I'm Michael. You know, I see myself as a defender of Israel, like the archangel, right? I did not name myself. But I assume that, uh, that, uh, that if I could be so presumptuous, I, I assume that responsibility, mm -hmm. not that I'm carrying a sword or anything like that. I try to, to share my knowledge to inspire others that they too may become better than I am. You see, because that is what someone did, my elder did that for me. He gave me an opportunity to learn. So now that I understand, why not give somebody else for those that want to learn? And that's what it's all about. It is... It is not about me. It is about who I serve and how I can serve him to the best of my ability. That's what it comes down to. So naming yourself is a no-no. It's the first indicator that you're on the round track. And you should correct that. Yeah, you see Moses, he never renamed himself. Exactly. And there's others too. You know, Hadassah was called Esther, mm -hmm. but her name is Hadassah, 
She didn't change it, you know, and, and things like that. Um, Daniel had other names and so forth. Meshach, um, I forgot all the names now. But the point is, others had to do what they had to do. But we have to maintain that integrity. You cannot violate your integrity because once you do that, you weaken yourself. You see? And this is why people create confusion because they want to be parent and child at the same time. Can't happen. Dr. Michael Hines, thank you for being on the network. This helped me out a lot. I was really curious about the the Jews in Portugal, and it seems like it, it, the history and this, this, this culture and the migration, it's, it, it's more than just one show. It's so much involved, so many nations involved, wars. Um, so this is a great jumping point, not just for myself to go out and research, but those that are watching, uh, they could pick up any little bits and pieces that you mentioned and go out and research it on their own. And I thank you for being on um, the network and for answering all our questions. It was my pleasure. I also want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce a new way of thinking. And I do hope and pray that this information will be beneficial uh, to a few people or, or to as many as possible. And they might find in this a new beginning so that they could benefit their lives as well. Thanks for having me. So learning about family history is essential to understanding ourselves. Also, it helps to keep memories alive, it allows each generation to have an idea of who they are and where they come from. Marcus Garvey once said, a people without knowledge or their past history Origin and culture is like a tree without roots. Until next time, thank you.